Wow. Well, thank you for having me here. As you heard, my name is Rafael Fonseca. I'm a hematologist and oncologist, and I work at the Mayo Clinic in Arizona. And as you can see from the title of my talk, I want to convince you that we're making progress in the fight against cancer. We live in a world where negative news and uh, unfounded skepticism sometimes cast doubt on this concept. But I'll show you some examples of how we're making progress, and very specifically in the disease I deal with, a disease called multiple myeloma. But let me start with a story. I'm going to show you a painting from the late 1800s. This is called a physician. And it clearly shows a girl that's there, obviously quite ill. There's a physician at her side with a light to her. You can see in the background her mother and her, her father has his hand on her shoulder. And um, this image is often used in medical circles to depict a time of medicine where perhaps uh, there was more humanism. I actually think it's quite sad. What this physician lacks are tools. Back then, they didn't have effective tools for treatments of simple things, even like a strep throat. This girl could be dying from a strep throat. And what I will show you next is how, with the right tools, we're making a very significant impact against cancer. So I'm going to show you a building where I work. This is the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center. We actually don't have a banner there. This was the architectural depiction of it. We moved uh, about a year and a half into it. And I love the building. I work there. You know, that's where my office is. But I'll tell you, my real hope is that the humans from 20 and 30 years from now look back at this time and say, can you believe the humans in 2018? They had cancer centers. How primitive. And I think that's a reality. And in fact, it's not far-fetched. I'm going to show you next what hospitals were a few decades back. We had hospitals for tuberculosis. You see the one on the left on Arkansas, a hospital exclusively dedicated for the care of patients with tuberculosis. And I bet most of the kids in this audience don't know what that disease is. On the right, there's a hospital in Mexico in the city of Guadalajara. This is called the Civil Hospital. Now used for many other things, but it did care for a lot of patients with tuberculosis in its time. Now, you don't have to go that far back. When I was in training in internal medicine a couple of decades ago, a third of our admission were for complications of AIDS. One third of our patients. In fact, we were building buildings. There were buildings that were created back then at the University of Miami exclusively for the care of those patients. I think that will be cancer. So let's go back in time. Let's look at some statistics. If you go back 100 years, you will see that the life expectancy for humans, humans was in the mid-40s. You go 100 years later, and it's in the mid-70s, and in some countries it goes to the lower 80s. Now I'll ask you to pay attention to the colors there of the different diseases that were killing humans back then. And on the left, you can clearly see that tuberculosis was killing as many humans as cancer does nowadays. We can change that. So cancer and infections are you know, quite similar in how they have challenged humans. They both represent a byproduct, if you may, of evolution. We have been able to control infections for the most part. It's possible that through a mutation we could have a human existential threat with a new pandemic, but for the most part, most infections we can treat. The disadvantage we have is that it's contagious. Now, cancer is not contagious, but it has one advantage over us, and that is that the cancer cells mutate frequently, so they can adapt to the different pressures. So how is this related to what I'm going to tell you? Well, I'm going to show you first how we have treated cancers over the years. Three modalities, and I guess most of you have heard these terms. Surgery, radiation, or chemotherapy. Now, sometimes they're curative. If you catch a tumor early on, you can excise it, and the person is cured. Sometimes, even with advanced tumors, such as could be the case, for instance, with testicular cancer, patients can be cured with chemotherapy alone. But we really maximize what we could do with these treatments and with these drugs. So we had to think differently. So what has happened over the last several years? Well, first I'm going to show you a graph, and this takes a bit of explanation, but it's very simple. On the x-axis, you see time, so years from the time of diagnosis. On the y-axis, on the vertical, you see actually the proportion of patients that remain alive after a given diagnosis. Now, this is a disease that is called chronic myelogenous leukemia. And if you go back in time, what you see in the lower colors there, in the purple, the black, and that blue, actually most patients didn't live long after they were diagnosed. 
When I was in training, we used to, we used to treat these patients with bone marrow transplantation, which can be curative in some, but many patients had terrible side effects. And what you can see at the very top on that top blue curve, so a flat curve is a perfect curve, is patients that are treated with the most modern of medications. Many of these patients take a pill once a day, and they can have near normal life expectancy. So the reason this happened is because we understood the genetic makeup and the mutations that gave rise to this leukemia, and that pill was very precisely developed to target that genetic abnormality. So that's one way we have done it. Let me show you another story. President Carter. So President Carter, now in his 90s, four or five years ago was diagnosed with metastatic melanoma. So that is a very aggressive form of a skin cancer. And when I say metastatic, that means he had traveled to other organs, including his brain. Now, when I was in training, someone with metastatic melanoma probably would have survived a year, perhaps two. Probably less so if they had brain metastasis, like President Carter had. Now, he received a new form of treatment, something called immunotherapy, and five years later, he has no evidence of residual cancer. Now, this is a very interesting story, because what happens is cancer cells can get very smart on us. So they cover themselves with substances or molecules that will fool our immune system into thinking that they're normal, they're part of self. Now, people figure that out, and they find out that if you use certain drugs, you can remove those molecules, or you can alert the rest of the immune system, so you can unleash it against these cancer cells. And that's what President Carter got. Now, this is working for many cancers. This type of treatments are very effective against cancers that have many mutations sometimes. And most recently, there's a lot of excitement about its use against lung cancer, one of the most deadly forms of cancer. So, so this is one of, the, one of the key treatments that has been developed for cancer therapeutics. Now, I'm going to show you another story. This is another story of immunotherapy. One of the most exciting things you can hear about right now in the news about the treatment of cancer is the so-called CAR T-cells. So what CAR T-cells are, are, it's a system through which you know, we physicians can remove T-cells, so these are part of your immune system, and we send them to school to be trained as assassins, assassins of cancer cells. Now, this is all through genetic engineering, so you take the cells out, they're manipulated you know, through genetics, and they're given back to the person, like a blood transfusion. And they go there and they fight. So what you're going to see in the movie here, which we'll play in a second, they really are relentless. They have no mercy for those cancer cells. And you see how it attacks it. Now, treatments like this have been able, and have been recently reported, to induce what we call a complete response, that is, total disappearance of the disease, in up to 75% of patients with the disease I deal with. Now, this is new. We don't know how durable. But obviously, my sincere hope is that this will be very long-lasting, so that patients who are running out of options can now be cured with treatments like this. So let me tell you a word or two about the disease I deal with, this multiple myeloma. So myeloma is a cancer that starts inside your bones, in the bone marrow space. Ironically, it's also a cancer of the cells that form part of our immune system. The cells are called the plasma cells. You see them at the top left there. They normally would produce antibodies. You know, you would be protected against viruses and bacteria by these antibodies. But the cells grow, and they become cancerous, and they can do a bunch of things that we don't like, including behaving like termites. So they eat away at the bone. What you see in the bottom left is an x-ray of a patient. And you can see those darker spots in the skull, which those are the lesions that these myeloma cells create. They can affect um, bones, for instance, in the spine, with associated pain, etc. Now, what I really want to show you is a list on the right. That's 11 mouthfuls, 11 new drugs that have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration since 1999. Now, I have had the pleasure and the honor to be part of very large teams that have participated in many of the clinical trials that have led to the approval of those medications. So I'm going to tell you a story about one of them. So what we're going to see is that these drugs actually can make a big difference, and I'll tell you how first. This is a study we did a few years back. Now you know how to read medical curves, so flat curve is really good, right? We did this study with, if you make Google-like tools, so what we actually took is what people call big data. We took very large uh, databases from insurance companies, 
where we could actually determine the time of diagnosis for a person. And then we could reference this with the Social Security Death Administration, so we could tell when the curve had to drop a little bit. Now, what you see in these three curves is what happens when we look at patients in the recent years. So those diagnosed in 2006 to 2007 are not doing as well as those that are diagnosed more recently. So the curve goes upwards. Now, you still see a gap. What you see at the very top is a control. So those are patients in those same databases that don't have the diagnosis of multiple myeloma. But we're doing way better. And if I may say, this curve stopped at 2012. We still have a bunch of new drugs that have come up you know, for our use since. So I'm hoping we're going to do better than that. So on to the story. It's quite an interesting story. Thalidomide. So in the late 1990s, thalidomide became one of the tools we're using in the treatment of myeloma. Now we don't use it anymore. We use the second and third generations of these drugs. Now, if you don't know this, and many of the young kids will not know this in the audience, in the late 1950s and early 1960s, unfortunately, pregnant women were exposed to thalidomide, particularly during the first trimester. And what happens is that children were born with very short arms or legs. That's called phocomelia in medical terms. And people figure out that it was because blood vessels were not forming that a baby could not grow an arm or could not grow a leg. So immediately it was pulled off the market. Now in the 1990s, this physician, Dr. Judith Folkman, who uh, was a surgeon at the Harvard Medical School, was giving a lecture about formation of blood vessels and cancer. And one of my colleagues, Dr. Berg Sagel, was in the audience. He heard it with great interest. And the day after, he gets a call from the wife of a patient who says, well, my husband really has no more treatment options for myeloma. What could I do? So he goes, I don't know, maybe call Dr. Folkman. He might have an idea for you. And sure enough, Dr. Folkman goes and says, well, you know, I've been thinking about this. Why don't we try thalidomide? Let's get thalidomide to your husband. So they go on, they call a company, back then a very small company, which was um, sort of a sidearm, if you may, of a textile company, Celanis. Now it's, this company is named Celgene. It's a big pharmaceutical company. And they sent just enough thalidomide for two patients to be treated. And they treated the husband of this person, and unfortunately, he did not respond and pass from his disease. But they had enough for a second patient, and they decided to use it. And that second person responded. And then the rest of the story. Within a few weeks, hundreds of patients were being treated with this. Very large clinical trials were made. And in 1999, this was the first drug of those 11 I showed you that was approved. And these drugs are now the backbone of what we use for the treatment of multiple myeloma. In fact, the story of thalidomide was uh, interesting enough that back in the day, they even had a musical about the birth defects associated with the use of thalidomide. Um, in back, back in that time. So let's go on to the, to the next story. In 2002, um, my research group and others were working on defining the genetic makeup of multiple myeloma. There's different flavors of this myeloma disease, and we found that about one in six myelomas had this very specific genetic abnormality. So we didn't want to be left behind like you know, folks who were treating CML. So what you see there is that little yellow dot represents an abnormal fusion of two genes. In this particular case, is that chromosomes 11 and chromosome 14 come together and form this abnormality, and this is what gives rise to myeloma. And we wrote in that paper that we envision a future where we will have a drug for the treatment of this variant of the disease. So come back 18 years later, trust me on this one, the yellow curve is just a tumor marker, what you see there is that after exposure to this new drug, which is shown there by that little white arrow, the tumor markers dropped. And I have a number of patients that I myself am treating with this medication now who are responding quite well. Well, we also didn't want to be left behind. I already told you about this story about the CAR T cells. It tells out these CAR T cells are incredibly successful, but it's very complex. You have to take live cells, send them elsewhere in a plane, bring them back, transfuse them to the patient. So we're exploring other avenues. Uh, one of the ways in which we're trying to recreate the same thing with a CAR T cell, you put a T cell next to a cancer cell, and as you saw in the video, it's going to attack it. So perhaps one way is you can 
infuse some substance that will bring them both together. The strategy is what I call the matchmaker approach. So we infuse antibodies that on the one arm recognize the myeloma cell, on the other arm they recognize the cancer cell, and they're brought together. Now what you see here in, in color green is a target cell. What you see in red is one of those T cells. What you see in purple in the middle, that's the area where they're working and that T cell is going after that myeloma cell. Now, I cannot tell you about clinical results because this is first in human studies, so we're treating the very first few patients with this approach. But again, our hope is that we can have results as good as have been demonstrated for some of the, some of the CAR T cells. So, what is it that we need? And you've heard incredible inspirational stories in the sessions of today. But I'm going to tell you what I think are other factors that we need. First of all, we need brains. We need research. We need hypothesis-driven approaches. We need people that, through their studies and through their knowledge, craft the solutions of the future. This is what uh, Taleb calls the Greek approach. Okay? But we also need hard work, empiricism. We need a thick skin. I can tell you, I've been in clinical research for many years, and you have to be ready for failure. Most clinical trials will not give you the results you want. So you have to be ready to go through the process and complete that process. But I think I show you the fruits of some of that. Now, what else could I want? Luck. Okay? Many of you probably know the history of penicillin. Dr. Fleming, who's trying to grow bacteria, one day comes to the lab and finds out that those Petri dishes that were taken by mold are not growing bacteria. So he says, aha, there's something there that prevents the growth of bacteria, and that's the birth of penicillin. And I'll share a story. My maternal grandmother died because of lack of penicillin. They were testing it. It was not available at the time. It was in a clinical trial. She couldn't get it. Now, it's important to say, luck favors the prepared mind. But what is the secret sauce? What is it that drives this desire to do better? I always say that today's best is simply not good enough. And that is hope and optimism. Because we can have the knowledge, and we can have the tools, but if we don't have the drive, we won't make that difference. So here's what I'm going to ask you. No matter what you do, I'm not going to ask you to be cancer researchers or doctors or investigators of any sort, but whatever you do, lead a meaningful life. You've heard it today. This world needs doers. This world needs people that will roll up their sleeves and do things. We don't need that many more critics. We need a few. Critics keep us in check. But most of what we do is important because of what's actually being done, not because of what we say about it. So we need those doers. So let me close with the following images. I'm going to show you first of, um, this woman. In 1844, she was the very first patient who was diagnosed with multiple myeloma. And her name is Sarah Newberry. Now, I know that because back then they didn't have privacy laws, so her name was in the medical journal there. And as you can see, she was uh, diagnosed with myeloma. She had broken bones. And she probably had a life expectancy of a few weeks to perhaps a couple of months. Now, the reason I have the figure of those Greeks on their knees is that her survival was probably the same as if she had been born with myeloma in ancient Greece. And what I really want to see is more what, of what I see in the right. This is a Christmas card of the family members of one of my patients who has been many years since he started treatment and is doing well. And I have a growing list of patients from whom I get Christmas cards like that. And I will close with one of the sayings that we have at the Mayo Clinic. I won't read it all, but I'm just going to say that the best interest of the patient is the only interest to be considered. Thank you for your attention.